Okay, right, let's get cracking then. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, the talk today is how to reduce the environmental impact of the digital technologies you are responsible for. This session is gonna run on till about two o'clock. Um, I'm aiming to talk for about 40 minutes and then we should have loads and loads of time for question, uh, question and discussions. Okay, so before I get into the content, I know many of you, but I don't know all of you. So uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit. So Hannah Smith, that's me. Um, I'm a freelancer. I live in Bristol, but I'm very fond of Bath. And as we all know, Bristol and Bath are very, very close to one another. Um, I have a number of different skill sets. My day job is that I am a web developer and I work predominantly in WordPress. Um, another skill set that I have is around management. So managing people, projects, processes, things like that. Um, I do a lot of speaking and writing. Um, and then I have a couple of side projects as well. So I recently co-founded a meetup in Bristol called Green Tech Southwest. Um, we're entirely online at the moment. Um, and you're very welcome to come and join us wherever you are in the country. Um, and I'm also involved with an organization called Climate Action Tech as well. That's a little bit about me. Now let's get into the content. So what is it that I'm gonna to cover today? Well, what I'm gonna cover is an overview of how digital tech can damage or impact the environment. There's many, many people that aren't aware of this at the moment. We have this conception that all tech exists in the cloud and that clouds just kind of float around and are relatively benign and harmless. And that's not really true at all. So I'm gonna talk, talk to you about that and hopefully dispel a few myths. I'm gonna talk about the impact that tech has when it's manufactured as well as when it's used. Um, and so we're gonna talk about the whole life cycle. And throughout the talk, hopefully you'll find that I'm littering it with tools and, and practices and practical things you can do that might help uh, you to lessen your impact. I always think that when you talk about what something is, you should also talk about what it isn't. So there's a few things that I'd like just to make clear about what this talk isn't. So this talk is not hating on the internet or tech in any way. I am a self-confessed tech head. I work building websites for a living. So it would be mad for me to give a talk hating on the internet and tech. Um, I do love tech uh, and the opportunities that it brings. I think are phenomenal. But a large part of this talk is about highlighting how wasteful we are with tech. And again, it comes from this, uh, I think this, um, thought process that maybe tech doesn't really have a cost or, or an impact. The other thing that this talk isn't is statistically exact. It's actually incredibly difficult to get rock solid statistics about the exact carbon emissions of downloading one site or another um, or about the cost of manufacturing X, Y or Z. Um, but I have found some statistics and I've tried to find the most credible sources that I can and they're all credited as well. So please, just any numbers I give you, they are intended to give you a sense of the size and scale of the problem rather than to be a number that you, uh, you know, you absolutely hold, hold on to because it's complicated and it moves all the time, these numbers, but for reasons that we'll get into a little bit as well during the talk. I'm just going to have a quick sip of my water. Okay, and then the last point is that this talk is not going to go in depth into climate science or why there is a climate crisis. Um, I'm working on the basis that you are here because you are already aware that we have a significant problem. Um, but I will just show you this one diagram that I sometimes re remind myself of. Um, so this is showing us the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 800 years, and we can see right now um, that we're at a, at a situation which is unprecedented. Uh, to use that word again, that damn word, unprecedented, pops up everywhere. Um, so, you know, if nothing else, I think this is a, a real wake up call for us to crack on with this pretty, pretty sharpish. Okay. Um, so, then just one other little warning. If you haven't ever considered the impact of tech before, um, you may get uncomfortable at the start. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk to you about 
aren't nice and they're things that you probably don't want to know about because they're they're not cool in any way shape or form um so look just a warning that you know some of this stuff may be uncomfortable but i'll try and balance that by um you know talking about loads of easy stuff that you can do to make a difference like today um as well okay so hopefully that's that scene you know a little bit about who i am a little bit about what i'm going to talk about let's get into it so the very very first thing that i think it's really important to communicate when we're talking about this whole arena of environmental impact of tech is that I firmly, firmly believe that reducing the environmental impact of tech is not a coding problem. It's actually a human problem. And what I mean by that is that a lot of the tools and approaches that we need to make a difference are already there. And a lot of it comes down to our behaviors and our choices. So more specifically, we can already make an enormous, enormous difference today by using practices and well-known techniques that are already out there. Culling and getting rid of data that we won't use or don't need in the first place. And we'll talk loads about that throughout, throughout the talk. We can also make a really big difference by not buying hardware that we don't need. And we'll talk about why that has such a big impact in a second. And last up, we can educate ourselves and others and, and you are already here doing that today. So, you know, thank you. Thank you for being here and, and for listening. Um, so there's a nice little link to an article at the bottom there. That's really sort of meant for any developers in the room. What I tend to find is that when developers and I am a developer myself, um, when developers first hear about this problem, one of the first things that they want to do is go and create tools or software to help with this. And this is a really, really article, a really interesting article that says, OK, yeah, you might want to do that, but actually consider your human impact first before you go off and do that. Anyway, essentially, I believe with all of this stuff, uh, knowledge is power. So, you know, let's empower ourselves and others to know about what's going on here. OK, so let's start talking. What what is going on here? What is the environmental impact of tech? and particularly digital tech. That's what I'm really focusing on today. So let's just talk about the size and scale of the problem first up. So let's ha have a look at the overall emissions from ICT. Um, ICT is, is a, a word that's used an awful lot in academic papers to talk about internet and digital tech. Um, so if you see me using the word ICT, that's what it basically means. It's digital, digital technologies. Just gonna have another drink. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> let's start talking numbers. Um, so the overall life cycle of ICT. So when we say life cycle, we mean manufacture, use and death of tech and associated data. So at the moment, the estimates are that um, the life cycle uh, carbon footprint is approximately 730 million tons of CO2 per year. So what we're looking at at the moment is that the digital sector is responsible for about 1.4% of global carbon emissions. So if you're anything like me, numbers are like, um, yeah, numbers are, well, they don't mean anything unless they're in context today. So what exactly are those numbers equivalent to? Well, a lot of people will say, oh, well, the internet is equivalent to flying to aviation and there is some truth in that but that's not entirely true um, the internet and digital technologies are on a par with the fuels burnt by the aviation industry you can't it's not the entire life cycle of the aviation industry but it is on a par with the fuels burnt and we talk so much about aviation um, but we don't really talk very much about tech so there's something to think about there. Why aren't we talking about this? Well, I think, as I've already mentioned, we're not talking about this because you can't see the emissions coming out of your computer or you can't see the emissions coming out of a data center because you probably don't know where data centers are. Um, whereas you can see the streaks in the sky 
from aeroplanes and therefore I think we are more conscious about the aviation industry perhaps than we are about tech. We also know that there's a very small minority of people that fly whereas we know that the internet is becoming more and more considered a, a basic requirement for, for life. I certainly think it is and COVID has certainly made me even more certain that having access to the internet is, is a human right. Okay, and then just a little more context for you. Um, this is a straight up statistic that's come from the Sustainable Web Manifesto. Um, oh, by the way, I'm gonna make all the slides available uh, for you at the end. Uh, this, this talk is full of um, links and resources and things you can check out. So if you're interested in the Sustainable Web Manifesto, um, you can find my slides and, and click on the link at the bottom. And the Sustainable Web Manifesto says that if the internet was a country, it would be the sixth biggest polluter. Um, so I don't know about you, but I see those numbers, which have been quite carefully researched. I'm pretty confident that they're in the right sort of ballpark. I don't know about you. I think there's a lot of work for us in the industry to do here. There's a lot of stuff we can do to reduce this impact. So let's start talking about manufacture manufacturing of devices and this often gets forgotten about and when people talk about the impact of digital tech they often talk about the data that's flying around or the software that's being written but actually let's just stop and think about the hardware for a minute so manufacturing uses energy so creating our hardware um, is is using energy and actually it's estimated that between 70 and 90% of the total pollution caused by making a digital device is actually created during its manufacture. So you can be as frugal as you like with your data plan and, and what you're using your devices for, but the very fact that you have one is already a significant impact. Now, again, I can't reiterate strongly enough, I am not saying don't have tech, don't use tech. But what I am saying is use it wisely. Particularly your telephone or your telephones, who calls them telephones anymore? Your smartphones. Um, smartphones are the most energy intensive to create and approximately 90% of the pollution is, is from the overall pollution of you having and using that phone actually comes from its manufacture. And I don't think we talk about this enough. We love to upgrade our phones. We love to have a shiny new thing. But actually, there's a really, really horribly significant cost. OK, now, folks, I'm going to give you a heads up. The next couple of slides are not going to tell you some very nice things. So, you know, if you're, if you're feeling sensitive or a little bit um, in a sort of sticky place at the moment, you know, feel, feel free to, to walk away for a few minutes. OK, so what we need to talk about here is not just the energy that goes into the, the machines that produce our phones, but we also need to talk about the uh, elements, the, the raw materials that go into our phones and particularly these rare raw earth minerals, um, which are actually very, very hard to find. And I found some statistics that, that suggested that producing one tonne of rare earth metal uh, creates 2000 tons worth of waste. So that is just completely bonkers. And especially at a time when we know that to become more sustainable, we need to be reducing our waste. I think that's pretty bonkers. Um, I believe that something like 16 out of 17 of the earth's rare, rare earth minerals and um, metals, sorry, come from, uh, are found in our devices and our phones. Um, so, you know, that's pretty nuts. Um, cobalt, for example, is found in every lithium ion rechargeable battery on the planet. So a lot of people say, oh, you know, electric cars, oh, they're, they're going to save us. But um, if they're using lithium ion rechargeable batteries, which many of them do, that is a problem. And that's a problem because, I mean, I'm just picking on one of the materials here. There is loads of research and loads of stories to tell us that actually mining for co cobalt is linked with uh, children as young as six working in mines. Now, I'm actually Welsh. I have a mining heritage and I know from family stories that mining is 
is a horrible profession to be in. There's not really a safe or pleasant way to mine. Um, and what we have is conditions in uh, African countries where people are, are mining, particularly in the Congo, um, where people are mining and you can bet your bottom dollar there's no minimum wage there or health and safety. Um, I think it's kind of shameful that our desire for new tech is forcing young children into mines. I can't get on board with that at all. I'm just not, not okay with that. And I'm sure many of you listening are not okay with that as well. So we need to understand that this new tech that we're buying and producing um, has a cost in terms of uh, electricity, but also in terms of these raw materials and particularly raw minerals that are going in. And let's just talk about e-waste as well. So once we're done with all of these machines and things that we've created, well, where do they go? So in 2019, an estimated 50 million tons, 50 million tons of e-waste was produced. So just stuff that we know, electronics and cables and machines that we no longer need it becomes e-waste. The UN estimated that in about in 2016, only about 20% of e-waste was actually recycled globally across the world. I haven't managed to find any newer figures on that. So if anyone does know of any newer figures, please pop them into the, the Q&A and I'll, I'll happily follow up um, and, and read up more about it. But yeah, in 2016, 20% of e-waste, that's not good. That's really not good. And the EU Parliament estimates that just obsolete cables generates more than 51,000 51, tonnes of e-waste a year. And I bet if we all go and have a look in our office drawers or I, I don't know about you, but I stick all my stuff in the loft, um, there'll probably be uh, bags of cables that you have as well. Now, heads up, there's another pretty horrible image about to come up. Um, this is actually the reality of um, recycling e-waste. So this is a picture of a, an e-waste recycling center in Ghana. Um, and typically what happens is that uh, the waste is burned so that uh, locals can extract the minerals and uh, set, send those back into the system and make some money off those. And I don't know about you, but honestly, when I think of something being recycled, this is not the image that comes to my mind. I imagine something cleaner and better. And so again, I think, you know, we're hitting upon another truth or uncomfortable truth here, which is that all is not what it seems with tech. We have these lovely slim, slim line machines that make us think everything is clean. But behind that is, is hidden quite an unpleasant story. Well, a very unpleasant story. OK, so that was a lot of doom and gloom. So let's talk about how we can make a difference. So these are very, very much human decisions and choices and behaviours that we can make. So first up, um, do you really need to be upgrading to the latest device? Um, many of our mobile phone plans offer free upgrades and we think, oh, that's free, great, or it doesn't cost very much. And actually it does cost someone somewhere, it's just that we're not seeing that cost. So do you really need to upgrade to the latest device or can you eke another year or two out of what you've got? Could you repair or upgrade a broken device? Um, this used to be a hobby of mine back a long time ago was fixing old Windows machines and kind of building my own machines. Not so much now, a little bit because uh, I don't know about you, but I'm finding particularly things like Macs a little bit harder to fix. There are certain types of phones that are being created so that they're not fixable. That said though, you can choose to buy or procure devices that are repairable or upgradable. And you may well have devices that you can repair or upgrade yourself. Um, an organization that I know of is the Restart Project and they hold fixing events throughout Europe. If you start digging around and thinking about it, you can find devices that are made to be repairable. I'll give you an example. We've just bought a new toaster. In fact, it's a second-hand toaster. It's made by a company called Julit, and all the parts in that are designed to be upgradable and fixable. So actually we bought a broken toaster and we fixed it and hey presto, we now have a brand new toaster. 
and hopefully we've managed to keep that out of landfill. So another thing then that you may be able to consider to make a difference is perhaps buying a second hand device, which I just talked about there, or maybe an ethically made device. Um, there isn't a huge amount of choice in ethically made devices, particularly like technical electronics. Um, for telephones, <laughs> call them telephones again, smartphones, uh, you might want to check out a company called Fairphone. Um, and there's also Ethical Consumer, which is a, a website that does a whole load of research and analysis about tech, and particularly devices. And I particularly like this tweet. This is from a lady called Kate. Now, hopefully I'm going to say her surname, no, surname right. Kate Raworth. I think I've said it right. Tell me if I haven't. Please put me out of my misery. Um, Kate is the author of something called Donut Economics. If you haven't heard of Donut Economics, you should definitely go and find out all about it. But I like this tweet. So she was advocating that we would you know, start looking at, at Fairphone, for example, for, for ethically made phones. So there's something to think about there. So there's some human things that you could do today to start questioning, you know, how can I make an impact? What do I actually not need? Or what can I reuse or, or recycle from, from other places? Okay, so we've talked a load about manufacture there. I don't really have much else to say on manufacture at this point. The kind of purpose of this talk is to trot through quite a number of different areas to give you ideas in all different aspects. And some of those aspects will be interesting to you, some, some won't be. Um, but I'm going to talk to you now a little bit more about the actual use of tech. So I'm just going to have another sip. OK. So I said to you that sort of 70 to 90 percent of the cost, the environmental cost is with uh, comes from the manufacture of your device. Let's talk a little bit more about the use of your device. And this is where a lot of people do tend to focus. So. And we can talk about how that use of your device has an environmental impact as well. So using the internet requires lots and lots of energy. So running servers, downloading data, uploading data, viewing the latest stats, etc., all requires electricity. And at the moment, about 3.6% of global electricity powers devices and internet use. So 3.6% of all the energy across the world is powering the internet or tech, digital tech, or ICT, if you're in academia, you might call it that. Okay, so, all right, so what? Well, I'm sure many of you are aware, are aware that energy production itself is not impact-free. So it wouldn't be an issue if all energy production was impact-free, um, but it really, really isn't. So in 2018, um, it's estimated that producing one kilowatt hour of energy uh, created just under half a kilo of, um, of pollution, of CO2 pollution. Um, so we definitely have a cost associated with producing energy. Uh, these statistics come from the IEA, which is the International Energy Association and they are from 2017. So in 2017, um, an estimated 65% of the world's energy was made with fossil fuels, 25% with renewables, and 10% with nuclear. We definitely know fossil fuels are bad. We do not want to be using fossil fuels to make our energy. And wherever possible, we need to be moving away from that. Renewables, yes, okay, they are definitely um, a big improvement on uh, fossil fuels, but they are also not without their impact. If we talk about the manufacture of renewables, um, it, it costs um, resources and creates pollution to manufacture solar panels and wind turbines. And at the moment, we don't really know what we're going to do with them when, once they've reached their end of life. So we definitely know that fossil fuels are bad, but really what I wanna get across to you in this talk is my opinion is that renewable energy is not a panacea. So it's not gonna fix all of our problems by moving to renewable energy because it still has an environmental impact. 
something that we can all do as people working in tech or people that are interested in trying to make a difference is we can start to look to reduce the overall amount of energy being used. We are so insanely wasteful at the moment with the production and use of tech. It's kind of mental. So there's definite thing that we can do to reduce the overall amount of energy um, that tech needs. And then we also need to think about making sure that the energy that we are using is used in, a, in, a, in, efficient, in an efficient manner and adds value to people. So again, it's just this concept of waste. We need to be looking at waste all around digital technologies too. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of get into a little bit more uh, technical stuff now. I'm not going very technical, so don't worry if you're, you don't really know what a server or a network is, don't worry, I'll keep it high level. But I do wanna talk a little bit deeper um, about some of this stuff. So let's talk about the energy consumption of tech. So what actually happens when we're viewing an internet page? There's three kind of key components or three parts that, that require energy. And one of those is your data center. So data centers are often uh, cl cloud-based data centers. Uh, that just means that they're co-located all in one place. They're not up in the sky and they definitely do create pollution, <laughs> lots of it. In fact, some, some folks I know that are at work in this area refer to data centers as the biggest coal-fired machines on earth because um, they are burning so much um, carbon, uh, fossil fuels to power them. So we have data centers and data centers are where we store and prepare our data when someone wants to view a page, we have our network. So the network is how the data travels to you from A to B. And then we have devices as well. So all sorts of different devices that use energy. So uh, desktops use way more energy, say, than mobiles. Uh, TVs and game, games consoles also use tons of energy. So one thing that you can do is try and use the right device for the right job. If you're just shopping online, you try and use your mobile if you can, because you'll actually be using a whole lot less energy by running that mobile. So each of these um, three different areas have uh, use energy. And we, I have some estimates for you for like roughly how much energy each of these component parts use. So data centers on average, when you're viewing a page, account for about 30% of the, the energy being used. Uh, networks about 28 and user devices 42 percent so this data comes from a really really great paper um, linked at the bottom so if you're interested in academic papers this is a really a really useful one for for estimating figures around this kind of stuff so one thing that we can do is look at each of these three areas and go okay how can we be better in each of these things and we'll get into having a little, little look at that shortly. Um, I wanna just talk to you a bit about data demand first. So data demand, data is basically what we're using tech for. We are consuming, creating, manipulating, um, analyzing data in different ways. So our digital tech really exists because we want data. And that demand for data, I'm sure, it comes as no surprise to you, is in crazily on the up. Um, and we'll talk about how much on the up in a second. I love this tweet. I saw this, I think it was last week by Becky, Becky Use. Um, I think she might be in Canada, if I remember rightly. Um, she's definitely not British. I love this tweet. She said, hot take, data is not the new oil. Data is the new glitter. Um, it lures humans in with its shininess. We all want data, right? It's very easy to accumulate. So yes, yeah, easy to, you know, stick data everywhere. It's found in places you're least likely to expect. It's almost impossible to get rid of. Who want, everybody keeps their data because they're like, oh, maybe it will be useful another time. And then she says, everyone insists on using it without thinking through the consequences. And I think Becky just wrote the best tweet ever. I, completely agree with everything she said there. Data is the new glitter. <laughs> it's a good phrase. Okay, so let's just talk about what is happening with data demand. So 
These, this is some uh, statistics um, about the annual global IP traffic. So this is the amount of data that's whizzing around the internet uh, year on year. So the internet, just, just go with me on this. Uh, I'm, people might argue different dates, but let's just say the internet roughly came into existence in 1987. Two terabytes were sent over the wire uh, around the internet in 1987. Um, compared with 2017, when there was an estimated 1.7 zettabytes of data. Now, if you have never heard of a zettabyte, you are not on your own. I, when I was researching this talk, uh, sort of a year or so ago, came across all these terms, and I've listed them in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen for you. So you can start to get an idea of just how astronomically mind-bogglingly big these numbers are. Uh, this is one zettabyte with all the zeros on the end. Um, there's lots of zeros. It's 21 zeros, in fact. Um, so this is a lot of data that flew around in 2017. Um, and then by 2022, it's, it's estimated to explode even further to 4.8 zettabytes, uh, which is kind of bonkers. And a lot of that data is coming from all at different places. Um, video is a big source of it so watching things like Netflix analytics is a really big source of, of data being created and generated too and gaming as well I'm not really going to talk about any of those things in this talk because I don't feel it's relevant to everyone I'm just going to keep to talking about internet and internet pages so I want to show you some statistics from something called the HTTP archive um, the HTTP archive, if you're a bit of an, a data nerd like me, you'll love it. You'll probably lose several days to poking around in there. This data came from last year, last September 2019. And it shows you how the median page, so the median, let's just say the average page, um, how that has grown in, in file size over the last what, five or six years. So on desktop, it's about 1.6 times bigger. So in the last five to six years, we are now seeing that 1.6 times more data is being sent with every single page request. So every single page request is now 1.6 times bigger on average than it was five or six years ago. And on mobile, that's even, even more of an acceleration. And that is now actually about 2.5 times bigger as well and we're lucky in developing a developed world site where we are most of us don't need to worry about our mobile data plan anymore um, but that's not the case for everybody so we also have a an inequalities impact here as well about you know whether we're being responsible with the amount of stuff we're sticking in mobile pages um, that's probably a subject for another talk but um, it's just something to be aware of but OK, it's not all doom and gloom. Here's some good news. Hooray, Hannah, you finally have a good news slide. Um, efficiency is definitely on the up. So there's been remarkable improvements in the amount of energy required to transmit and store data. In fact, it's been decreasing by half um, every two years since 2007. So here's a graph. It's not to scale. Sorry. I really need to fix this graph actually, but you can see that between 2007 and 2010, the amount of data, uh, the amount of electricity being used by ICT shot up quite a bit, even though we know that demand massively skyrocketed between 2010 and 2015, you can see that the amount of energy is, is flattening out, even though demand is like shooting up. So that's, that's a good news story, but what could we do if we actually reduce demand? Um, we, could, we could make some big differences to the amount of energy that's being used by tech, etc. So here's some ideas. How could you reduce data demand? Well, only storing and data you only storing, only creating and storing data you actually need. So if you're a developer like me, do you really need like a year's worth of backups of data? Uh, do you really need all of the different staging sites or development sites that you have? Um, can you go back and, and clean yourself? clean up behind you in any way if you're someone that works in marketing do you really need all that analytics data could you reduce some of that and if you're neither of those then you could reduce demand by thinking about any apps that you have on your phone perhaps that you don't need they that would that requires data to even just to run updates 
Um, so there's lots of ways that we can reduce the amount of data that we're using. If we're reducing the amount of data that we're using, then we, we need to store less of it. And therefore we're gonna need less machines and devices as well. So we have a knock on impact back up to that manufacturing problem as well. Um, I mean, these are fairly small things, but you can reduce demand by looking at your emails, like how many emails you're getting that you've signed up to. Every single email that gets sent has a carbon impact because it has an environmental impact because it has to come from A to B to get to you. So, you know, are you just deleting emails from your inbox or maybe you don't even delete them? Maybe you could unsubscribe. And if you're someone that's creating emails and newsletters, think do I really need to be creating this? Maybe you do. And if you do and it's serving a great purpose, then, you know, please, you know, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, do you need to? And is there a way that you can make it more efficient? Using less social media is, is another thing that we could all consider doing for other reasons apart from environmental impact. Uh, not sure it's all that good for us. Um, and we can also look at improving the performance and tech, uh, the performance of tech and content that you create. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly too. So this is an awesome book and an, also an awesome person. Jerry McGovern has written a book called World Wide Waste. I have a paper copy of it. You can also get it online. It's definitely worth checking out. And Jerry has a lot of incredible things to say about data and how data is, is fueling, well, he, he calls it killing, the, killing our planet. Um, so that is definitely worth checking out and definitely worth following him on Twitter if you are a Twitter person. Okay, let's talk a little bit about data centers. Do you know, even when I time these talks, somehow when I'm delivering it for real, it, I'm always behind. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, sh shimmy along a little bit and, and try and be done talking by 10 to. OK, so let's talk about data centers and data centers are where we store and serve our data. So not all of our data centers are created equal. Data centers have different levels of efficiency, uh, depending on how they're built and how they're managed. Um, there's a really important metric called power usage effectiveness. Um, that will tell you how effective a, a, a data center is. If it's got a score of about 1.2, then it's considered very efficient. So um, it's, you know, what that means is that it's, it's putting uh, 0.2 um, energy into overheads, such as cooling or you know, security, things like that. So it's worth, if you're, you're picking data centers, having a look at that number, that PUE number, if you're a little bit less technical than that, like I definitely have no idea how to build a data center or, um, you know, set one up. I use services from other people and to find green hosting or green servers. I use uh, something called the Green Web Foundation, um, which is an organization based in well Berlin and Netherlands, and they have an incredible data set of uh, providers running on green energy. Um, it's very easy to submit um, uh, updates to the information. So if you uh, find that they're saying a data center isn't green, but you know contrary, you can submit data to the Green Web Foundation and they will update their records. Um, and all of that data is available um, as an SQL light and it's all open data. So there are lots and lots of tools that make use of this data. And I'll show you some of those shortly. Um, they've also developed an, a lighthouse add-on. So if any of you measure performance of websites, um, you might use something called Lighthouse. There is an, an add-on called Greenhouse, which will help you understand if uh, the server is running sustainably or not, or, or running on green energy. Um, there's another area that's very, very interesting. And I'm just going to signpost you to this if you are... Um, a developer and you're interested in software engineering, you might be interested in checking out principles.green. That is an emerging discipline at the intersection of climate science, software practices, architecture, electricity markets, and data center design. Just kind of bringing all of those things together to give advice and guidance on how to um, software engineer sustainably. Is that a verb? I don't know, it is now. Uh, so definitely check out principles.green. And another thing that you might consider doing 
I really wasn't sure where in my talk to put this slide. Uh, so it's ended up here. Um, static sites are also really, really worth a mention. Um, if you are looking to reduce the environmental impact of websites that you create and are responsible for, you might consider serving them statically. And we don't have time in this talk to get into the ins and outs of all of that. Um, there are pros and cons of doing this. Um, I'm a WordPress developer. WordPress is not a static site generator. It is a dynamic site generator, um, but there are ways of turning WordPress sites into static sites using services like Stratic and WP, WP2 Static. Um, so there's lots of stuff to get into there. And if you're a developer, as I say, it's well worth um, considering static sites. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about networks. Um, so networks are the part of how we send our data and we have some choices that we can make here to reduce our impact. And it basically comes down to choosing the least energy intensive data transfer method. Now, a lot of this stuff is not within our control. So we don't actually like the roads that we drive on. We don't necessarily get to choose um, how our data gets sent to us, but we can choose almost that last point of transference. So I'll come back to that one in a minute. So we can, for example, choose wired connections over wireless. Um, there is, um, there are um, energy reductions to be gained by using wired connections over wireless. Um, actually using Wi-Fi over 3G uses significantly less energy as well. Um, in fact, 15 times more energy, uh, 3G uses 15 times more energy than Wi-Fi. So that's a significant choice that you can make if you're at a cafe or something and you want to look something up, don't just use your data plan, see if you can get the Wi-Fi code, just make a difference. And use 3G over 4G if you have that choice. And also local storage over cloud storage. So if you can store something locally and send it over a wire and have it stored on a hard drive or something like that, that is a, a less energy intensive method. Okay. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about data and the service so that the kind of content, the actual gubbins inside the, the data is, is what we are producing all this stuff for. So we talked about data centers, which store the data and hold it for us. We talked about networks, which send the data to us. Let's talk about the data itself, the content itself. So first question, and I don't know whether people ever ask themselves this enough, is why are we creating this stuff in the first place? Um, do we actually need this stuff? Have we overlooked any side effects that we haven't thought of yet? And I mentioned that, you know, my experiences of talking to, to developers about this sort of stuff is that they often jump to, oh, I'm going to build a tool or I'm going to make a, um, an app or I'm going to do this that will help everybody. And it's like, well, okay, that's cool. But have you really thought about the side effects of this? And a good example of side effects is something like Google Maps. Google Maps is now responsible for driving a lot more traffic through residential areas than before because people follow the directions and Google Maps map routes people through residential areas. And then this is one of my mantras. I say this all the time, probably much to the annoyance of other people. It's just because you can doesn't mean you should. So there's, there's things to think about there. Okay, it's 10 to, so I am gonna have to speed up a little bit. Um, I'm almost at the end of my slides though, so that's good news for everyone. Okay, so some of you may have heard of something called planet-centered design. I think that that is very relevant to thinking about content and thinking about the service that we're designing. And what that aims to do is build upon something called user-centered design, but actually put the planet and the environment at the center of what you're designing around and thinking about the concepts there. Uh, if you're a book reader, you might like this book, Designing for Sustainability by Tim Frick is really, really interesting. Okay, so I am just going to skip through some of this stuff. I'm just going to show you these tools and then we'll stop and hold off for um, questions. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of these tools. So if you're interested in kind of measuring the carbon impacts of websites, 
particularly websites, um, this is a great tool to get you going. It is called the Website Carbon Calculator. It is made by an agency in London called Holgrain Digital. And you can visit it now if you like and pop in any website address and it will give you an output like this. Now, this is absolutely great for giving you a sense of how big your problem is, if you have a big problem or a little problem. Um, it's not the only tool that's out there and it doesn't give you an awful lot of detail. So if you're a developer, you're going to find this tool probably useful for talking to showing clients that you have a problem, but not really so useful then for um, actually fixing the problem. So there's a couple of other tools I signpost you to. One is called EcoGrader that gives you a lot more in-depth analysis and a new one that's currently in beta called EcoPane that looks really, really interesting too. And so basically as a web developer, um, we and designers, we need to be thinking that planet-friendly content basically has a small file size. So a lot of people in the world of performance will be focused on pe page speed load page load speed, <laughs> speed of page load, let's say that. Um, and actually, if we're interested in planet friendly content, that's not really the right metric to focus on. Because you can almost like fudge the system and actually serve bloated content really quickly. And what we're trying to do is only really serve the bytes of data that matter. So the metric for us as developers to be thinking about is page weight budget first, and then speed of page load second, but it's that page weight that really, really matters. And the biggest impact comes from video and media. So I have a few more slides here to just encourage you to uh, really pay attention to media content. Wherever possible, don't autoplay videos, so avoid those annoying uh, background images, uh, background videos that play when you load up a page, They're not great for environments. Um, and also use techniques that we know are good, such as lazy loading images and videos. And there's a link if you don't know about lazy loading. And just to say, you don't have to own to be a website owner to do some of these things. So, for example, there are loads of settings in social media where, like on Netflix, for example, you can stop them auto playing videos when you're browsing for something to watch. Same with LinkedIn and Twitter as well. You can put settings in place so that you're not auto playing video. So you're reducing data demand that way, even as a consumer, you can do that, which is really, really cool. Okay, anyway, I am going to move on because it's five two, and I reckon we want a bit of time for questions. So I just wanted to mention carbon offsets because this always comes up when I do a talk on this stuff. Um, carbon offsets, in my opinion, are useful, but they're a last resort. And that actually what we should be doing first is trying to eliminate waste. And that really should be our first effort. Just buying carbon offsets. It's, if that's your only option, great. It's better than nothing. But it should be last on your list of, of things that you can do to, to, to make a difference on environmental impact. Okay, so whew, thanks for listening, folks. That was, that was a lot of information I've, I've piled at you there. So I'm just going to summarize for you now and we'll hop over to questions. So is tech actually an environmental problem? Well, to summarize, it's not a straight answer. It's yes and it's no. So yes, it's a problem because as we saw, we have an environmental impact and every single industry across the world needs to be taking uh, action to reduce their carbon emissions and environmental impact as well. So that's including us within tech. So are we a problem? Yes. But also, no, we're not a problem because we, the, the tech itself is such an enabler for other sectors uh, to reduce their carbon emissions and also can really improve quality of life. And actually, there's information that shows that tech has already identified 15% reductions um, across the world for global uh, for carbon emissions. So moving this back to you, what can you do? So we've talked about tech is a significant cause and even more so because it's we allow it to be wasteful. That is within our control. We do not need to be wasteful. That is just laziness, in my opinion, on our part. And to some degree, lack of education as well. People maybe don't realize 
what they're doing. We can all reduce our impact by considering the energy being used um, to produce and power the tech that we are using. So if you own a phone, you're responsible for that phone and what goes on it. So you can, using hopefully some of what you've learned today, make an impact already by, by considering how you're using that phone. We really only want to be serving and receiving bytes of data that matter, that add value to us. And I encourage you all <clears throat> to get talking about this with others and spreading awareness. One of my elderly neighbours said to me the other day, Hannah, I've got something to tell you. You work in computers, don't you? And I was like, well, yes, I do, Laura. <clears throat> and she said to me, did you know that data centres aren't actually in the sky? And, and she was deadly, deadly, deadly serious about this. She really, really thought that all the data lived in the sky. And so we have a lot of work for the, uh, in the tech industry to get communicating this to other people and spreading awareness that what we do is not without impact. There's a couple of other useful resources that I will signpost you to. Um, again, you can check out my slides and, and have a look at some of those things. Okay. My slides should have already gone out on Twitter. So if you are a Twitter user, you can find me at HanopCan. And if I use TweetDeck correctly, there should be a tweet there now um, with a link to these slides. So I guess we can move into questions. And also I should say just a really big thank you to all of the sponsors of Bath Digital Festival as well. Cool, Becky, hi, you've appeared. Hello. Hi, sorry. I, I just um, wanted over. to mention as well, actually, that um, this session is being recorded, so we'll be able to be available to attendees after the festival to watch again if they feel like absorbing or reabsorbing the information. Yes, there was quite a lot of information, so there's <laughs> a lot to absorb there. Thank you, Becky. Um, so you do have a couple of questions. Okay, great. I'll uh, see what we can fit in. Um, so I'll, I'll try and start from the top. So. Um, <laughs> Are there stats on the environmental impact of paper books versus ebooks? That is really, really interesting. And yes, I believe that Jerry McGovern in his book has produced some statistics, some estimates on that. Um, so check out Jerry's book and, and follow him and ask him. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but yes, I have seen statistics around that. I think it's something like if you read a paper book 10 times, then that's better than having it electronic is what pops in my head. But uh, yes, that, that is off my head, so it might be a little inaccurate. But yes, you can find information around that. Great question. Yeah. Um, and do you see the issue of energy waste as a consumer more so than an industry and legislation problem? It's everybody's problem. It doesn't, it's not one, one sector's problem. It's not a consumer only problem. It's not an industry only problem. Wherever you are and whatever capacity you're in, it's your bloody problem. <laughs> I hate to say it, I'm sorry, it's an awful thing. I do think that those of us that are in tech have a lot more um, opportunity and privilege to make a bigger difference, but I do think it's up to everybody. I think if you're a consumer, you wanna be trying to buy renewable energy as much as you possibly can. If you're in industry, you want to be procuring that as much as you possibly can. But I do believe that this is climate change, environmental crisis that we have is everybody's responsibility in every capacity. Great, great question. <laughs> so this one probably leads quite nicely on from that. Um, so someone's asked, um, you seem to focus more on the actions of web developers, companies, data centers, etc. Should we be focusing on these or is there a case to be made for users collectively changing our online behaviour? If yes, what is the top guidance you would give, assuming we will not stop sending emails or doing Zoom calls, for example, especially given, given the alternatives are also energy consumptive? Oh, OK, there's a lot in that question. Um, I do think that it, uh, it would be great to see some more people led campaigns around reducing our waste of what we're doing. I do tend to focus more on developers and things like that, purely because that's where I work. That's, the, that's what I understand best. But also because we know that tech, digital services are such an important driver of behaviors as well. 
So if we had Netflix, for example, starting to say, did you know that watching this trailer just consumed, I don't know, 400 grams of carbon, we might start to see some changes being made. So, I mean, something I do in my spare time is I contact all the companies that I use, either as a, a web developer or, or as a regular consumer, and, and ask them questions about their environmental responsibility and their sustainability policies, and particularly with regards to tech. And I would love to see more people joining in and banding people together to, 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 to put some campaigns forwards on that. Greenpeace in the past have done some amazing stuff. Um, check out the Click Clean reports. If you haven't come across them before, they're really, really good. Um, but do you know, so many people don't know about this, that there's actually not that much to campaigns and things to really draw your attention to. Other thing in that question is, I agree, we're not going to stop sending emails. And that's not what I'm calling for. What I'm calling for is for us to be more mindful of the wasteful crap that we're doing. That's really kind of my focus. Do you really need to send that gif? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a, a great response. question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then one last question, which is not a silly question at all, actually, Ruth. Um, but should we be switching our phones off at night when we're not using them to save energy? And that's an amazing question. Now, I can't say for phones because I don't know as much about phones as I do about desktops or laptops. But actually, if you are, I've seen plenty of articles and plenty of suggestions to, to say that if you are using, if you're not going to use your laptop for more than two hours, you should power it off because actually you will, the net effect is that you will start to save energy from, from actually powering it down. I don't know about phones, Ruth. That's a really, really good question. Um, I mean, one thing I do at night is I do turn off. So we have a timer switch on our internet at home. And that turns off all of our internet every night between like midnight and 6 a.m., something like that, as a power saving measure. Um, and I also always put my phone onto airplane mode as well so that it's not sending or receiving data or trying to ping for data at night. But more specifically, oh, it's a really good question. I'll have to look into that one. Definitely. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> I'd say it's probably a good mindfulness tool as well. If you're not using it, just turn it off so it's not constantly tackling your brain. Yes, it's just I don't know about the, the power implications then of turning it back on. Oh, yes. So that's the thing. I'm just not sure about what the energy consumption is for, for firing the thing up, which is why I do it in aeroplane mode. But yeah, that is something to, to find out more about. Sure. Interesting. Question. There you go. Mm. So that, that's, that's all the questions. Fantastic. Fabulous. So we're done. Excellent. Yes. Well, um, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for those of you that asked questions. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Um, feel free to find me on Twitter. Feel free to ask me questions and on LinkedIn as well. Hannah Smith, WordPress developer. There's lots of Hannah Smiths. You should find me that way. <laughs> cool. So uh, thank you to Bath Digital Festival for hosting me today and to all the sponsors. I hope you all have a great rest of afternoon and no doubt we'll see you soon. I'm going to end end us end us now. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs>